So George, tell me how does API design change when agents are your primary users? There's a lot of things uh, where we've been, you know, many years have come, uh, have passed where we've been building these RESTful APIs, very um, normalized, like resources per endpoints and like developers are the intended audience um, or developers that ship code that consumes the APIs are the intended audience. And that's not like precisely compatible with how LLMs kind of used their knowledge or their built-in training and navigate APIs. Um, they're much more fuzzy. They openly interpret a, a different system that they're talking to. And it's not rigid, like call this API, call, then call this one, and then precisely like composing those requests. In that world, we've, we've in this, the LLM agentic world, there's been techniques to like bridge that gap, um, but there's more work to do for the developers that own those APIs to make them even more presentable to LLMs so that they can have more consistent results out of them. Um, but yeah, there's certain practices where they just don't, aren't precisely compatible. There's also the, the sort of um, the issue of like the amount of context you're using as you navigate an API. That's something that you really want to keep an eye on. And it varies again. So like if you're now entering the world of LLMs, you're taking into account like the context window size, latency of your API, um, yeah, the failure modes, like what happens when it gets a call wrong? Is there enough information for it to get it right? Um, a lot of that hasn't been always consistently encoded in the APIs we've, build it, we've been building to this day. So there's a bit of work to do to, to bridge those gaps. Okay, and is this a problem that Speakeasy is trying to solve? Yeah, certainly, because we have seen sort of firsthand what it, what it means to just take an API and wrap it up for an LLM to use as tools. Um, and it's not a it's not a smooth journey, and there's like a lot of learnings to have, um, and we think we're sort of going down that trajectory and solving the problem for our customers. What some of the kind of unusual things that you've seen LLMs do when uh, an API hasn't maybe been prepared and, and packaged for for use with uh, an agent? Yeah, when you put your all your entire API surface and turn it into tools, the funniest thing that happens is first the LLM makes the wrong guess about which tool to use. <laughs> And once it realizes that, that it's done the mistake, there's like this sort of cascade of events where it tries to call so many other tools that it's just not figuring its way towards a solution to the, to the initial prompt or the initial problem. Um, so there's this kind of like runaway problem. <laughs> um, and then uh, in other times, um, just like when you have no credentials to call an API um, or the LLM doesn't have the right credentials mm -hmm. to call it, Again, it does this runaway thing where it tries every other angle to figure it out. Some LLMs are a bit smarter. They go, I don't have enough information and they stop. But certainly like the funny ones is when it just kind of goes down a rabbit hole of calling one tool after the other to achieve a purpose. Like when they're overconfident in yes. what they're trying to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, let me try another thing. Let me try another thing. And you're like, maybe stop. We're, we're not, we're going down a rabbit hole. Can you tell us in like one or two sentences what Speakeasy does and how it's solving Okay, maybe, maybe more than two sentences, but tell us what it does and how it's solving this problem specifically. Yeah, sure. So Speakeasy um, started as we take your open API, your description of your API, and we have a code generator that turns it into SDKs into multiple languages. Later on, like in February, we started doing MCP server generation for our customers. So they, like every TypeScript SDK had an MCP server that users, your users could install. And then from that, is where we learned about our, our various issues with just turning an API into straight up tools, um, which led us down the path to create a new product called Gram, kind of sits alongside um, the code generator. And that's more of an experience for like rapidly iterating uh, over your, the tools that you're generating with your API, improving their quality, and then sort of doing some more context engineering, like building prompt templates and, and higher order tools that we call. Um, and yeah, just kind of like the, the workflow of taking an API and putting, putting it into a tool and generating an MCP server is not as, it's not very conducive to like rapid iteration. Because what you want to be doing, what you're focusing on to get better tools is like improving the names of the, uh, the tools, improving their descriptions, um, trying to vary the descriptions and test how things like behave, with the, like how the LLM behaves. What's your, your definition, your distinction between uh, a tool mm -hmm. and an MCP server? Like you're kind of using them, not interchangeably, but mm, I, I'm yeah. not, I don't really understand um, 
what what you mean when, when sure. you talk about tools and NTP servers is different things. Absolutely. Yeah. So model context protocol is primarily like it's almost like a de facto standard at this point mm. for packaging up um, AI capabilities, language model capabilities. So one component of a MCP server is the list of tools that an LLM can call. So when you install an MCP server, the server publicizes, here are the available tools that you can call to get more context from the real world. Is tools like a, an endpoint? Is that a tool? A tool, anatomically, a tool is a, it's got a name, it's got a description, and it's got an action to take, um, or, and it has an input schema. So like what, what arguments does this tool expect? And then it has an action that it will take. So you, you're the developer creating an MCP server will kind of um, code that action. Um, so, so I'm trying to map this to like a traditional REST API. Mm, yeah. And so that might be uh, sort of the equivalent of a, a resource you are. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm with you. Uh, like, uh, like it's analogous, but there's sort of nuance to what we do in REST and what uh, we do in MCP. Yes. Okay. Okay. So sorry, carry on. So that's, uh, that's what you can define a set of tools mm -hmm. that you can make available to your LLM. Yeah. And uh, Speakeasy has a, 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 a software that enable you to hand your API yep. to Speakeasy and they'll generate what for you? Yeah, so we'll generate, essentially we'll create a catalog of all the endpoints translated into tools. Mm. And now you can sort of slice and dice them into like subsets. Um, and this kind of talks to a different problem, but you slice them into subsets and each subset is its own MCP server. So for example, you can have just the components of the Stripe API that deal with charges, like querying charges, creating charges, that kind of stuff, as an MCP server, like cohesive in that in its purpose, and then that gets uh, that can be installed um, in with any LLM uh, client, like the Claude Desktop app, um, and we handle creating the MCP server. Like the moment you've created that subset, there's a hosted MCP server that you can directly install um, in your favorite. Um, desktop app or agentic framework um, and you can have like its own domain and everything it's like very identifiable mm. and you can use that either internally so like teams within a company have uh, building and proliferating servers for agentic use or you can publish it for your customers and users to interact with on the over the public internet so you mentioned in your your talk that you'll be giving later on today mm -hmm that you, you need to make your APIs more discoverable. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in the context of LLMs then? A lot of it is to do with um, it like the, 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 the problem uh, that we found is that the current API descriptions, like whether you're using OpenAPI or something similar to that, um, the way these have been put out into the world by various companies has not been designed for an LLM to understand. The descriptions are usually very um, either non-existent, uh, short and very terse and lacking in detail, or like overly, um, they just have a lot of extraneous details. Mm. Every tool's description is essentially a, a, a bit of context that the LLM uh, has when it loads up the MCP server. So if you've not invested in um, properly packaging and properly describing these tools, then you're going to have a very hard time getting, you know, people in the world like integrators, customers, using agentic frameworks and methodologies to talk to your API. So what we want to solve is both the quality of what you're putting out in front of LLMs and the distribution. The distribution is kind of like neatly solved by MCP. So we've just gotten behind that. So now the, the exercise is how do we improve the quality um, and, and the distribution through the ho like us hosting servers for our customers. So how would you retrofit an existing API? It's it, interestingly, like the current narrative in the world is you can't take an API and turn it into tools. And I tend to agree with that to a large degree because a lot of endpoints um, are very normalized. As in, you, for example, you have an API that returns a paginated list of things mm. and it just has IDs of things. So like the customer ID or the order ID. And so <clears throat> let's say you tell an LLM, find me a particular order and get me some details about it. It's just gonna have to do like a lot of um, API calls or tool calls, I should say, <clears throat> to solve that problem potentially, or especially if the desired order is like three pages into the API. Okay, and, and what's the issue with that? 
Well, as you're doing that, um, you're you're using up valuable context because you're you're throwing this data in. Like you're putting the first page, that's going to enter the context window. Mm. Second page is going to enter the context window, and so on until it finds the desired result. And then it has to do another call to get you know the specific re or resolve the specific ID. So that's like an inefficient use of context. But that's like we don't think of pagination as some bad thing. Mm. It's just when you when when an LLM is confronted with here's a paginated API to solve a problem, you could really blow through your Something context. You're, you're adding waste and noise. Yeah. yeah, and there are various techniques to tackle it, but that's just one example. And some of the more successful APIs, you know, uh, have have figured that they need search endpoints. For example, like the Stripe API has a customer search endpoint, and probably like uh, or definitely a customer listing endpoint. So you want to direct the LLM to search. And it's, they're really good at composing search queries. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, like by this point, a lot of LLMs um, have been trained on the Stripe API, so they even know the query language to a degree. So to go back to the question, you want to create new APIs. You don't have to like say write off your current API. You have to create new APIs which are very compatible with language models. And incidentally, they're just going to be compatible with, for integrators as well, like search endpoints and like the expand API that you have in the Stripe API, those are really valuable Like because you can make one tool solve a whole problem rather than needing multiple tools that start to use up context. So it's interesting. It's almost like creating APIs that that you could think more easily as a person to use yeah. rather than as a machine, right? Like, how, like you wouldn't, if you were searching for something yourself, you wouldn't want a list of a thousand things and go through each page one at yeah. a time, would you? That's absolutely right. Like the... Really, it just clicks when you start to think, as a developer, before, before all of this, when you're trying to interpret an API to like navigate it to solve a problem for your business, you're doing the same thing or very similar things uh, as a thought process to an LLM. And you're trying to navigate the documentation. You're trying to navigate the arguments. It's kind of very similar. So if you start to think that the NL and an, an LLM is like a junior engineer and you want it to have the highest success rate navigating stuff, you start to invest in different aspects of your API. What about things like rate limits and error messaging? Right? How do they play a role in agent to API? Yeah, certainly rate, rate limits um, exist and LLMs will hit them, especially if uh, it's, <laughs> it's going through a manic loop of like calling various APIs. Um, really, it's down to the intermediary. So when you're building your MCP server and you're encoding like for this tool, make this API call, you want to make sure you're adding the defenses in. Like if you encounter a rate limit, you respect the retry after information that the server is sending you. If you get an error, um, it is possible to like enrich things. You have an opportunity. It's not just a straight up call an API. You can interpret this API at that MCP layer, add context to it, um, and even like add, you know, if you're if you're stuck here, go to this troubleshooting tool, or like you feed the error message to a subsequent tool, and it can help solve the problem. So there are uh, and retry is also um, kind of like uh, the sibling of rate limits. So you're trying to respect uh, these uh, as you're coding your tools. Going back to the thing you were saying earlier, where you don't really, to what I understood is that you you wouldn't really want to have a a, a of context where you're using an MCP to chain a number of calls together. Is that is that correct? Did I understand, misunderstand that? No, there is value in like okay. chaining of tools, but you don't want the chain, like you want it to be directed towards solving a purpose, a right. goal. Um, if the LLM, like you can tell, you can usually tell the difference uh, between when it's running away because it's not converging to a solution right. and when it's calling a chain of tools because intuitively this is the right chain of tools to call to solve a problem. You, you, can, you can't really have, uh, to a degree, you don't want to have a, a, a tool that's like all encompassing and answers any question. Yeah. Like it just, um, when a tool becomes too open-ended, there's more margin of error for the LLM to like call it the wrong way. But really well-made tools that compose together in a chain to solve a problem um, is such a powerful concept, and um, hopefully I can show you that later on as well. Yeah, I definitely want to um, want to see that. But I I wonder, like, what do you think about the future? Do you do you see a point where agents are the primary users of our of our APIs, or do you think there's 
there's some middle ground where we're sort of using them in conjunction? I think that in a, in a way they are going to be like a predominant user of, uh, they're the, the predominant integration between mm. services. Um, the world is certainly rapidly moving towards that with MCP and Google's agent to agent protocol. We're going to start having like kind of autonomous agents in the field. It's, I, I'm not into like betting, but uh, it, it's within the next 12 to 18 months, I think we're going to see more proliferation of these like autonomous systems that are acting on behalf of a, one of your customers behind the scenes. They're certainly like capable today. Um, so it's really just a matter of companies understanding the technology. This is kind of the biggest hurdle at the moment is like, there's a lot of impassioned people that understand this stuff, but there's the productization story and how to put these in the field. And once we've like um, crossed that threshold, I think it's going to be like a rapid adoption. Amazing. Well, George, I want you to show me your demo in a moment, but for now, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Us. Appreciate it. It's been great.